Uh, you can set the room temperature very easily, um, and it means that it learns your circadian rhythm, if you like, it learns your rhythms of life. So it learns the use of each room and each thermostat over a, a week, a month. Um, it's got a learning algorithm such that it can predict what temperature you want it before you want it at that temperature. Yeah, that's a new initiative. I think that's the new initiative. But yeah, so it, you know that is one of those. That is exactly one of the things to do. Next, we've now got these new ones. Well, new ones. We've now got the new feature. And um, smoke alarms and fire alarms, right? And they work in, as a matrix of fire alarms, so that um, you can have different alarms going off and, and, and alarm, alarms talking to each other about fires as fire is progressing around the building. Okay, so a uh, fire alarm will go off and talk to the next fire alarm saying, oh, well, watch out, it might become this way. Or and then you can get a 3D map of where the fire is. Okay. So that's, that's another way you can do it. Okay. You can also see that there's a control, um, a very easy way of controlling things. So generally it's just a touch screen, all very slick, and you can just, um, you can just scroll down using the bevel, you can dial it in, um, or you can actually, this the method it twists around, okay, so you can set that as the, the actual, uh, as the um, dial, uh, dial up and down, or you can use the touch screen. So this doesn't really come with any, without with very much uh, documentation. Okay. It's all right there. We can see that it's quite useful, it's quite obvious to do, well actually what we're going to do, we're just going to twist the dial, that gives us up or down, that's straightforward, right? You know, twist the dial is something that we all are used to. And, um, and, what, and what you can also do is, if you really want to, press it and you get the reaction, so you can change or remove its learned behavior. Okay. So that it makes a mistake, you can remove it, you don't have to stay with that state, or set it so you can explicitly say it's not that. You can this So there's a couple of things in conflict here. First of all, it's not accessible if you're blind, for a start, obviously. But secondly, it's actually very, very intuitive to use. We'll get onto intuitive because whether there is intuitive intuition is a whole different thing. But uh, it's very familiar, shall we say, to use. Okay? Quite straightforward. Oh, yeah, I can understand I'm, dial I'm using a dial here, and I'm, uh, and I can press it, press the dial, a different screen comes up, and I can mess around with this one here. It tells me change the room, done, that's it. That's all you need to do. So in this context, it's very nice, very easy to use, very low cognitive load, it looks really nice. You get different colours, the colour conveys whether it's warming up, cooling down, whether it's too hot, too cold, that kind of thing. Okay, so you get to understand the colour based on the background colour. Now, let's direct your attention over to these awesome thermostats here on the wall. This controls, this thing here controls that. It's so ugly that they've put a little flap over it because it's obviously terrible. And it's got a whole heap of controls here that allow you to do different things. However, it expects you to read these controls in a, um, in a horizontal format. Yet, the reality is that you, you might think about them in a vertical format. Often you do, because up is normally on top and down is normally you know, on the bottom, right? So here, it's got plus. Minus is on the, on the left side. Plus is on the right side. But actually, just above it, just below it, is another button with an arrow on it as well. So if you're actually pressing plus here, you might be thinking you're adjusting the timer. But you're not, because this is the thermostat. So generally, it's just increasing the temperature. It's not doing anything else. And there's loads of... I mean, how to, how to work this is really difficult, because you've got a nice LCD panel that's not got any touch on it. But the LCD panel has got one, two, three, four, five sections of different kinds of, num of numerics that are up here. So it's got the mode, it's got whether the fan's on auto, not on auto, all these other things, the temperature, and there's one down the bottom which is blank, for some reason. So the likelihood of, of me being able, if this nest thing was up here, jobs are good. Enough. If the nest thing isn't up there, then I'd have a problem doing that. At 8.30, because I think about you guys all the time, 10.30, I come in here and I switch this, um, this one over here, this heater on. I switch it to 22, press the on button, because that's all I'm going to have to do. 
There's no, nobody knows how to set the timer. Not even the house services can set the timer. So nobody knows how to set the timer. The, all, of the, uh, the, all of the documentation materials have been lost. They've been thrown away. So we have no idea of what we're doing. We're all on the internet. All I know is that every Wednesday I come in here at half past eight, press the button, get set to 22, after all, press the button, press the button, and then I go away. That's mine. Now, if you've got this, Hey, it can remember that I wanted it at 22 over this period of time because we're all here. And it will even start, start to you know, change the temperature maybe for the next set of people who are coming in at 1 o'clock or something like it at 24 degrees, whatever. But the, the point is that this thing is remembering stuff, right? I don't think you don't need a manual, you don't need anything to do with it. This thing here is a nightmare for me because I have to come in and set it up. Sorry? What would happen during the summer, let's say, if you remember that during the time it has to be on, and in the summer things change? Because if, if in the summer and things change, it still has a memory, it learns that, so it can learn. So once a summer it will keep the room and then it will learn? No, because what will, the, way, the way that it will learn is that it has to have external input to learn. So generally, it might very well be that have services come in here to tidy, to tidy all this up in the morning, and they would just turn it down. To whatever it is. So if it knows that over this period of time, because it's got a memory of more than just a week, it knows that over this period of time, it will learn to turn down. But maybe a long period of time, it will learn to, learn to vary the actual uh, the temperature. Just like if you go on holiday. Now, if you have services, when they come in here over the, over the summertime, they can easily just say, well, actually, to this thing, change. We don't want this to learn the clock thing. Do it. The default with this is, is that nothing, that nothing ever works. And so the default is we never use them. No, no, people don't have work to do it. All right, and that's why it's pretty much freezing all the time again. That's cool, right? Why have we got this? How much are they? I don't know if anyone's doing that. I don't know. It could be a dull speech. So we've got a fancy problem, which is if you've got a little option. Well, I've been asked, but most of the holidays are. Yeah. I mean, you know. And also, for most UK, UK, the most, I mean, you know, most UK houses certainly are on the house, but I've been, it's got no, no, well, I don't have a first time in the room, just have a first time that sets the heating right. Well, these, the idea of these is you've got one in every room, so if you've got ten rooms, you can't see these in every room, you've got ten They are just for the room stats. Now, it's supposed to save you money in the long run because you've got rooms. If you can, if you've got a system that will control, that has control of each room, then you know, maybe that's okay. But there we go. It seems people do like them, do like them. So, okay, and this is what I was saying. A modern thermostat. I think I've taken away the maker so that uh, we can't turn it off. It looks like Honeywell to me, but there we go. Because uh, I've got an extensive knowledge of the first class, you know, uh, And you can see, look, there's numbers on it, and there's some more numbers on it. I have no idea what the numbers are, probably the time, 62 something, 74, 45 something, and a number of different bits and pieces on the side. Who knows? Well, just more complicated than that. So this is all about the balance between whether it's whether you can actually use something and whether it's efficient. Okay, relationships of UX, ergonomic, or human factors to usability. So this is this is the clarification of new here. Something of usability as the software specialization of a larger topic of ergonomics. So ergonomics is how things fit, buzz, or work. Okay. That's what it means, ergonomics. It's about how things fit to be working. So normally, this is about physical stuff. So you get lots of ergonomists. Uh, who are building chairs and tables and these kinds of things, and they're the exact, correct, exactly correct level. See these tables? These tables here are assuming you are all the same size. Because they're not just the same as the chairs. The chairs are assuming they're all the same size. Okay. Everybody needs to bring in Sean Becker. Becker is on this. Now, yeah, Sean Becker on this. Yeah? Four guys. Huh? Don't you have any? Yeah. 
And he's got this awesome desk, which is like, which is like an electronic raising device on it, because it's tall. And it actually raises to a standard place, but also sit down there. So you can sit down and everything raises up and down. No, it's just awesome. Like that. So it's super ergonomically balanced, right? Because it's exactly right as it is, like seven foot. Okay, other new topics is tangential. The ergonomics focusing, focusing on physiological, whereas usability focusing on psychological matters. Okay, so, so usability is about how we're thinking about the system, whereas ergonomics is about how we're actually physically interacting with it. Experts have written separate but overlapping framework in these aspects. Okay, we're going to get on to these different uh, things later on. University, so, so one aspect of usability is this idea of universal design, all design for all. It's a big thing, and there's a lot of people who were who did the work have this idea that in the old days, usability and use was a really difficult thing to, um, to comprehend for a lot of people because they built these kind of things, okay? These chairs, these things you couldn't move. Computer systems you couldn't change. The idea of universal universal access is a bit of a mis misnomer. <coughs> it means, what it means is that everybody should be able to access a particular piece of software. Okay. That's what the universal access means. That's what universal access, design for all movement means. It means that you look at the majority of people and you decide how you can best accommodate as many of those people as possible. But not all. Okay. Not all. So, in some ways, it's wrong. Because it was meant to try and accommodate everybody, but the actual text says to accommodate as many people as possible. Well, what is possible? It's subjective. How do we measure the possibilities? So, what you get is people who design universal and universal design. Actually, it doesn't, it's trying to take everything into account, which is a good thing to do, but it doesn't quite make it because it thinks that, in, that it, if it takes everything into account, everybody will be um, addressed, everybody's issues will be addressed. And we know that that's not the case because people are individuals. UX says they're individuals. UX says their needs change on a minute to minute basis about how they're feeling, what are they capable of doing, etc. It also says a focus on deciding products so that they're usable for the widest range of people operating in the widest range of situations, as is commercially practical. Okay. as is commercially practical. Thus, universal usability is more a function of keeping all the people and all the situations in mind. So it's good to keep all the people, all the situations in mind, all the situations of use in mind, how might this be used, to create a flexible, commercially practical piece of software. But you'll never get everybody if you don't have accessibility, if you don't have openness, if you don't have um, flexibility. Okay. Now, I've got an unconventional view, because I have an unconventional view about everything. It would be one of my unconventional views here in the uh, Universal Access and Information Society journal. At the bottom, if you read it, that level. By trying to address all these needs in one design, the technologist is apt to address them all. So, why is that not just one email program? I've used some of <laughs> What's the point of Should need to have preferences. We should just have one thing. 
across universal design that these exist at all. But we don't. Even in the small number of email clients there are, we've got people who hate them, like them, don't like them, blah, 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 for whatever reason, right? They're more difficult. Because cognitive style gets in the way. You know, you have a different way you want to do things. Things don't fit that cognitive style. We've got different ways you want to interact with the interfaces. They don't fit with cognitive style. So, if this was also the case, there's a, there's a famous guy, Alan Dix, who does a lot of work in HCI, um, and a number of folks uh, have books on it, and one of his things that you'll see in the notes is that, you know, if you go into a sweet shop, technically, if there was universal design, it's like saying you only need to sell one sweet or one chocolate bar, because you can get one chocolate bar that suits everyone. But that's not the case, because when people have a choice, they make choices that, uh, that they like, okay, for some reason. There isn't even one design. That's why I freaking hate these iPads, where I've got to use Apple, the Apple Mail client and the Apple, because there's no other way I can get, uh, can get anything on there. Okay? It's a nightmare. Okay. Making software is not just about the useful trade of view of software, it's about personal choice. And we'll come to personal choice next week and the week after when it comes to this idea of affective and engaging. And great flexibility in configuration of interfaces, interactions, and solutions. So we can configure each thing, each interface, to our own particular wants and needs, each to each way of doing something to our own cognitive style. But of course, it's not, it doesn't happen because it's not going to be commercially practical. Okay, it's life Okay, so back in the old days, usability, as we know, was all about quantity. And what people wanted to do was understand how to predict how an interface would, how a person would interact with an interface in a quantitative way, so to take that. And the way we did that was we decided to have a thing called a human processor model. Wow, these, these, these slides are terrible. Okay. Human processor model. And this was Card Boren and Newell. Okay? Card Boren and Newell. So the idea of this is that you would calculate how long it takes to perform a certain task. You would then have experimental time to calculate the cognitive and motor processing time. So you have a model of human cognition, which was very simple just was really about how long it took you to move your cursor, how long it took you to cognitively understand the words of certain length, of certain complexity, and how to try and then predict the best path through a piece of software to get the task done in the shortest amount of time. It didn't matter whether you were enjoying the task, as long as you did it. Okay? Think of a rat moving through a box. Okay? That's, that's what it's trying to do. Trying to get the rat through there. The thing at the end, and the thing at the end is, you don't have to use the software any, anymore. That's your reward. You don't have to use the reward is don't use the software anymore. And to get there, you have to read out the process. Why do you have to use the software? Okay, that's important. Use this company for uh, perceptual motor processes along with visual imagery. <coughs> and the problem with this is that it didn't work. We're too complex. Okay? We are too complex machines for this to ever really work. It was a good attempt to start. But anyway, so we can't quantify these systems using the human processor model, and we can't predict how people would interact, and therefore what they want next, and therefore what we should put on the screen next. Okay? They just didn't work. So we thought, it's a bit like artificial intelligence in some way. We started with artificial intelligence, and now we're machine learning. You know, let's get rid of the machine learning and so we can't have this. But then we thought, how can, we do, how can we still have this idea of predicting the goodness of user interfaces by only their quantitative value, their quantitative usability, their quantitative interaction? How can we predict them? What we're now using is the big hole of the human processing model. And the decision <coughs> that we um, had to do was, in fact, actually, use a thing called goals. Okay? Let me go back one. What does this thing mean here? Confounding variables. What are confounding variables? And the answer's in the name. 
Now our computer science is the science of computers. Confounding variables are variables that are confounded. What are they? Confounding variables. Yes? because we can't take them into account. They confound what we do. Life is complicated. It's full of confounding variables. And as we'll see, laboratory-based studies, if you've done psychology, lots of uh, laboratory-based studies in psychology are all about controlling the environment to reduce these number of confounding variables. Okay. But that's not ecologically valid, as you'll see. Okay. So it means that while you can get experimental information that's kind of useful in the laboratory setting, Efficient controlling confounding variables. In the real world, these confounding variables exist, so not taking them into account into account is silly. Well, it's not silly, but it's, it's it doesn't give you everything you need. Okay. So, too many confounding variables for this to work. So they went to this other more, more structured system called domes. <coughs> We're looking at gold. What does what the user intend to accomplish? Operators are actions that are performed to get a particular goal. Methods are sequences of these operators to get to a particular goal, and selection of the rules used to choose which ones you're going to go to. It's a specialization of the human process model. What do I mean by reductionist? In a, in a scientific punch up, what if I was um, if I was on the Internet Monkey Cage? Who was the Internet Monkey Cage? With Brian Cox? Our own Brian Cox. Jesus, you guys are like cultural freaking cave people, aren't you? <laughs> God! Radio 4! Come on, man! Okay, the Infinite Monkey Cage. It's a, it's a scientific, uh, sort of amusing talk show deal. Anyway, we'll get that I'm, I'm going to just get that. Reductionism. If I were, so what you'll find in scientific concepts is social scientists say that physicists are reductionists as a slur, because physicists want to reduce everything to particles. Our entire world is all particles. Everything can explain everything by particles. Okay? Or quantum, or whatever the hell the number is today. For the flavor is today. Okay. That's what we can that's what we can reduce everything to. And social scientists will say so physicists will say, yeah, we're scientific, we can test everything. We've got no, you know, everything everything for us is testable. We can get proofs. Because the world works based on this way. Okay, on our theoretical models and experimental evidence. And the social scientists say, yeah, that's crap. Because you're not reduction, you're trying to reduce the life experience of people and the, and the university and particles, and that's not how it works. Because the interaction between the two is too confounding variables to do that. Okay? So, this, we'll see that what happens is to try and get more testability, we have to get more reductions because more time to control everything if we are to explain it. Okay. That's the problem. If we have to explain it to, so as to understand it, or understand it so as to explain it, we need to reduce it. So that's what goes is about the reductionist. And guess what? It still doesn't work. Okay? There's lots of stuff which, which, which tries to work on goes. It doesn't really give us that accurate, that much accuracy, especially in complex interactions. Especially in complex interactions, whereby things might take more time, but the actual user doesn't care about that time. So, this is work on things like the user's perception of time. Okay. I was watching the TV show the other day, and eight minutes seemed to take like 30 minutes. Which is really just a lot of Four minutes. Okay. But you won't watch it for a few minutes, I'm sure. So, you know, if anybody has ever watched The X Factor, that seems like it goes on for 10 hours, because it's just such a horrible TV show. Okay, so perception is different to reality, so, you know, this doesn't take these fine clips into account. So then we get even more reductions, and we've got keyboard level. Okay, so this is keyboard level names. So it's more simplistic than goats. It's amenable to computation because it's super reductionist. It's about keyboard level stuff. Simple clicks, okay, this kind of stuff. There's a tool that you can go and get 
cough tool, you can use this. It's a very famous cool, uh, tool, um, and it's a CMU, the Nano, um, and it's a very, it's a very interesting tool to actually use for your application, but it won't do everything if you need something. It's not widely used, it's still the right hence it's in CMU. However, its developer was poached by IBM, so it might very well be that you can get some IBM products coming out there soon enough. Okay. It's been being developed a long time. So here's an example of a usability model in, um, in uh, Cogtool. So this is from Richard Bellamy, Bellamy, John Swalwell, and Thomas. And this is the, this is the uh, psychology programming uh, uh, conference. Um, and here they, they uploaded their application into Cogtool, which you can do. Okay, it's got the sort of you have to make descriptions in Cogtool of what things do and what the connecting screens do. You have to connect things together because it's really just a, um, it's a mock-up, it's a mock-up prototype for a, what kind of, what would be my prediction? So sure. what we, what's the other name for a mock-up? A more computerized mock-up, so. Where there's nobody, where there's no real machinery, but Somebody is driving it. Huh? No? No, no. Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. So it's like a Wizard of Oz thing. There's no real machinery behind it, it's just testing the different ways you can get from spot to spot. Okay, a measure it. Based on, it measures it based on it, based on the model it has of humans. Okay. And the model it has of humans is obviously not super. I mean, it's good enough for some stuff. It wouldn't take anybody to account. So here you can see this this frame here is their coding frame because they're talking, they're interested in how we understand coding, how we code. So this is part of their application. And then the steps occur here. Okay. The other steps are automatically placed by the tool. The life steps are demonstrated by the person actually saying give you some output. So here it says this thing here, for instance, is saying this is keyboard entry. Somebody's actually done that. Somebody's entered something on the keyboard. That's the person. Cogtool is then saying, right, well, actually, we're going to do all these little things here afterwards. Think for 1.200 seconds. Because who's that? What's that? Yeah. Is this something we could use for our third year project, like realistically, or is it going to be too much work to like, get to speed with it? Probably going to be too much work to get up to speed with it, but I question the value of. Um, the additional march you get for the effort. Right. You can find it useful in your first year project to get to. The first year project might go to a whole different scale of effort to more than one as the moment is there. So there's a certain amount of effort you have to put in, and when you have that work, the more rewards increase. So getting about 80, if you're really up to it, is doable. Getting a, adding this to get 100, or getting 90%. Now there's a lot more work you need to do to get that, so you know, that's a good but it might be useful to just have a look at it. I mean, it's interesting, I think. Yeah. So, instead of using this new project, do some revision. Okay, and then we'll get the usability model that spits out at the end, which tells us when things are going to happen. So, look, it says things like in this frame, this is a frame that we're actually looking at of, of the old command line interface. We've got vision, we've got eye movement. We've got eye movement, we've got cognition, we've got left hand working, we've got the right hand working. Okay. So the difference here is that their level of the human has a certain amount of time allocated over and over again. Um, the old, so this thing here has a model of people, and it says based on how far apart <coughs> things are on the screen, then it can make a prediction about how long that will take for you to move the cursor to it, if you want to make a selection, how long it will take for you to understand what those words are, based on how many they are, how big they are, understand eye movement, how far, how far will your eye need to move to a different distance to actually get a selection task. Okay, so if you've got a control in the bottom left, and you've got a bottom right, sorry, and you've got a, a box in the, bottom, in the top left hand corner, 
and you want to select the, the button at the bottom right, how long will that take to do from where you're looking? So first you need to look there, that takes time. But then you need to process what's there, that takes time. Then you need to click, that takes time. And it adds all this up and tells you how much time still takes. And that being the case, you can compare different interface layouts to each other and you'll see that they'll reduce or increase the time. And therefore, you can say, well, this interface is better than this other interface because it produces cognitive processing time or it produces an environment that's associated with it. That's the that's one of there. Okay. So <coughs> anyway, so read the next chapter. Be a reader. Yeah, be ready to answer. Chapter so cute. Yeah. Ah, oh, dear. Sloppy, sloppy, sloppy. Don't follow my example, otherwise, we'll pay on the door. Uh, discussion topic for next week. So remember, you've got to get this submission in for next week, week six, right? That's and we'll be having this as well. And remember next week, it's the BBC. So from 11 to 12, the BBC will be here talking to us about user experience and how user experience works in the real world if you want the user experience to use. Okay? It's not examinable. 11 to 12 is not examinable. However, for additional efforts and for additional thinking, Including that, might be useful in your job. Yeah? Okay?